Welcome to Church Online. I am so excited that you have joined us this morning. I'm Pastor Matt. I pray that our worship will be exciting and uplifting. I pray that the ministry of the Word will work in your heart and that the Lord will do something special. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the service. So Jonah chapter 1, last week, uh, we went through and verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son, the son of Amittai, and he's like, hey, listen, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah's like, nah, I'm not going. And so we followed Jonah on his journey through, you know, he goes out to sea and he gets thrown off the boat and he gets swallowed by a large sea creature. Um, and, and that's kind of where we left off. And so, but this week, we're, we're continuing that story. And so my premise last week was, um, was the director's cut. Uh, we were looking at the story from God's perspective. Why? Because it's not Jonah's story, it's God's story. And we should be looking at our lives the very same way. Uh, we should be looking at our lives as though God is the one who is over and in our story, and we are just a part of it. And that, if you go back and listen to the message, it just, it makes so much sense of the things that we struggle with on a day-to-day. And if we were to just shift our perspective uh, just a little bit, man, it's, it's super helpful um, so I thoroughly enjoyed last week, and this week, uh, I, think, I think it's going to be just as good. I don't know. Uh, somebody, I'll, I'll pick on somebody who knows who they are because they can hear me from the hallway because they're working security. Um, but <laughs> I was walking down the hallway, and they were like, oh, you're preaching today. And I said, yeah. And they were like, but Pastor Matt's back. And I was like, okay, what's your point? <laughs> like, why does that matter? And he's like, oh, I mean, you're good, but like, you know, pa- Pastor Matt's back. And I was like, okay. So yeah, I'm preaching today. <laughs> So, but back to, the, back to the normally scheduled programming next week. You'll be rid of me for another month or so. Um, but if you want to follow along with me, my notes are in the program. Uh, if you go to Bethlehemchurch.cc slash program, uh, my sermon notes are there. You can follow along and you can read ahead if you'd like. Um, but we're going to start in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it, the proclamation which I am going to tell you. And so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. That's good preaching right there. Uh, Jonah arose and, and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days walk. So chapter three kicks off the way that maybe you would have expected chapter one to go. Um, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and Jonah says, okay, let's do it. And God's like, that's more like it. You don't have to get swallowed by a fish this time. It's great. You know, like this is, uh, and so if I, if I had to title this, I would call this Take Two. How many of you have ever given or been given a second chance before? Yeah, it's most of us, if not all of us. Some of us are just a little modest. But this is kind of where we're at in Jonah's life, where he is, he is bearing and, and giving a message of forgiveness and repentance to the Ninevites, uh, the enemies of his people. You know, we talked last week how the Assyrians, Nineveh was an Assyrian city, um, and to date, these are some of the most barbaric war tactics that, that we know of were the Assyrians. And the Israelites happened to be the benefactors of that at certain points. Um, the Assyrians were responsible for, you know, for wiping out 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel at a certain point. So as you can imagine, there's, there's not a good relationship here. And so Jonah was naturally hesitant to take this message to them. He was like, I don't want to go there, number one, because it's dangerous, and number two, because I don't care about them, Right? And so this time, God says, hey, go to Nineveh, and Jonah says, okay. And so as we, as we go through this, what I want to kind of set in your, in your minds as we look at this is I want to give us some, as we go through this story, I want to give us some practical helps of how we should navigate having a second chance, because Jonah here is getting a second chance, and his message is all about getting a second chance, basically. I've seen the VeggieTales movie, I know, you know, I know what it's about, Um, but you know, so that's what it's about. And so as believers, we have been given the ultimate second chance. We really have, and unlike any other. And so as we go through this text, I want to just kind of navigate some of, maybe some of the pitfalls that Jonah experiences and some of some practical helps for us navigating our, uh, Gabe, I thought the FBI was walking in, but it's just you and your suit. That's okay. Um, <laughs> teenagers, are we awake back there? Are we okay? Give me a nod. Still kind of sugared up from the apple cider last night? Okay. We had an event last night, just to give context. Anyway, but as we go through this, I want you to think about that. How are we navigating our second take? And so last week, we talked about looking at life through the director's perspective. And in this part of the story, it's the same 
It's pie in the sky perspective, right? This is God's story. It's still God's story. When the director of your story offers you a second chance, he's in fact being very gracious. Why? Because we don't deserve it. Jonah, you know, has been spit up from a whale and he's probably sitting on a, a rocky beach off the coast of the Mediterranean and he is faced with the, like, man, I, I survived that. What am I now going to do? How am I now going to respond to God's calling on my life? And as he waits, the word of the Lord comes to him a second time. And as we talked about last week, the word of the Lord is not a, it is not a vision or something that he hears uh, in Old Testament theology, when the word of the Lord comes, it is a physical manifestation of God himself. This is God appearing as a man to Jonah. Like, this is a big deal. So he's just sitting there, and somebody strolls up and says, you ready for round two? You gonna, <laughs> you gonna do your thing this time? And Jonah says, yeah. Uh, so verse three indicates that Jonah obeyed and was now prepared to say whatever God would tell him to say at Nineveh. He no longer would resist, or at least for now, telling a positive message to his nation's enemies. Having a second take also means that the director of your story does not want you to be defined by your mistakes. Let's think about this, let's think about this from a cinema perspective once again. If you're filming for a movie or whatever, I've never been in a movie. If you're watching this and you're a filmmaker, I'm more than willing. I'll sign a contract, you know, I'll be an extra. But... Um, but if, you've, if you're familiar with filmmaking at all, you know that the whole movie isn't shot in one take. And second takes are given because the first one was, was garbage. It was no good. And so, but the reason that it's no good is because it's a mistake. You messed up or somebody messed up. And so the whole point, the whole point of a second shot is like, hey, let's not look bad in the movie. Let's not make a bad movie. So we're going to try this again. And so when God comes to Jonah a second time, he says, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a chance to write what you did wrong. I'm going to give you a second try at this thing. I'm going to give you the same command, and I'm going to set you loose, and we're going to see how things go this time. That's, that's incredible. And so from our perspective, like, look, we've all been given a second chance, and throughout our lives, we are given second chance after second chance after second chance. And the reason why that we're still breathing today is because God says, you are not defined by who you used to be. You are not defined by mistakes that you have made in, your, in, in the now or, or in however long before now. The Bible says that he has cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? I don't know, but it's pretty far, right? And so we are not to be defined by our mistakes. Paul says this, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. And that's, we're gonna circle back around to that idea. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf, therefore, from now on we recognize, from now on we recognize that no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now, we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. And we hear that all the time, but do we ever apply that? Do we ever look at that and legitimately think in our own minds like, yes, I'm not who I used to be. I don't have to dwell there. Anybody ever have those, this is like a sidebar item, Anybody ever like lay awake at night like, man, I said that really awkward thing when I was like 12, and I just really wish I could take that back? You, uh, no, just me? Okay, never mind. But, but you don't have to be that anymore. You don't have to lay awake at night and be like, man, I just, I wish I could go back and right all of those wrongs that I did to people or did to my family. Jesus said, no, you, you don't have to be that. Why? Because you're not. You're not. You've been given a second chance, not because of what we've done, because of what he's done for us. And we're gonna see, I think, four baptisms today. And these are a testimony of what God has done in people's lives. These are real time, like you're watching real time second chances happen. Like, it's a big deal. Shout out to all you guys getting baptized today, it's awesome. Um, so, now this is kinda interesting. The reference to Nineveh being a, a three day journey uh, doesn't mean that it would've taken three days to walk across. I've heard this, we hear this growing up, and once again, this is another one of those pieces to the story that gets over like, you know, kind of like, you know, children's book eyes. I don't really know how else to call, call that, but it does. They're like, it took three days to walk across that city. 
And you're like, wow, that's really big considering how long ago that was and all, you know, all the different details. But anyway, but the reference to it being a, a three-day journey doesn't necessarily mean that it would have taken three days to walk across. What it means is that for someone like Jonah, who holds the office of a prophet, which was looked at in a similar way to the office of an ambassador, um, it would have taken him three days as customary to get through the city because it would have been different days of meeting with people, and on day three, he finally would have been able to deliver his message to the king when they had a scheduled meeting. And so, why is that important? I'm not just, like, what we're not doing is we're not just shooting down everything that you ever thought. This is why it's important. Jonah makes his way into the great city, and his message is urgent. His message is so important that he doesn't wait three days to give it. He, you know, it would have been customary for him to walk in and, and the front desk of the city or whatever and say, hey, I'm Jonah, I'm here to make an appointment with the king, I have a message. And they would have been like, oh, okay, cool, well, tomorrow you'll meet with his assistant and we're gonna give you a tour of the city today and, and then in, you know, in about three days you'll be able to have an audience with the king and we'll schedule that for you. you know? And Jonah would have been like, oh, okay, great. So am I staying at the Best Western or like, you know, what's going on? Um, you know, but Jonah walks into the city and his message is, is urgent. Verse four says, he began to go through the city, one day's walk, verse four, and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 days. It's a very, it's a very short message. And for Jonah, like what he had to say was not worth waiting for. What he had to say, what he felt in his soul, and this is very different, right? Let's contrast this from chapter one and chapter two, Jonah. The Jonah who didn't want to go at all now says, I got to get this out. I got to say this right now because it's important. Why? Because it's what God has for them. His message is important. Like these are two radically different Jonas. Unfortunately, we'll see that that doesn't last. Spoiler alert. But it's clear that for now he's experienced a change of heart and his response to the Lord's call is appropriate, this go around. In Jonah's mind, this cannot wait. So he delivers a very short and seemingly ambiguous message on his first of what would have been three days. So here's, here's the thing, right? We're talking about second chances. And we're talking about, you know, Jonah's on his second chance and he's delivering a message of second chances. And he goes to Nineveh and he says, 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. And they're like, oh, that's a big deal. And can I tell you that, and this is, you know, this is not feel good stuff that we like to hear, but can I tell you that when you get a second chance, that necessitates a choice on your part. When you were given, like Jonah was given new life, you know, when Jonah was spit up from, from the, the, the chaos monster, we talked about that last week, he was, you know, it was thought of as he was, you know, it was portrayed as a sea monster. When he's spit up from this thing, he is, he's experiencing a very fresh new outlook on life because he thought he was not gonna have it, right? And nobody else did either. And so he's, he's, he's faced with a choice upon being, you know, thrown up from this thing or however, regurgitated, whatever term you want to use. Um, but when we as Christians receive our second choice, when we accept the gospel and, become, and we experience new life in Christ, that necessitates a choice on your part. What are you going to do? And I think a lot of us were like, oh my gosh, church is so fun, I come, the coffee's great, and and all these different things, but we forget about the whole like repentance thing. We forget about the fact that we were spared from the consequences of our previous life because the new life is actually different. We will experience different results because we live a different life. And some of us who sit here today, myself included, we have a really hard time choosing to live like we are living a new life. Choosing to have the perspective that Jonah had when he was spit up from the whale, like, wow, God is so good. I'm gonna, like, the message that I didn't care about before, I, I care about it now. And because I care about it, I'm gonna go into, look, like, picture this in your mind. He's going into an enemy city of people that probably wanted to kill him. And he says, I'm not just, like, I'm gonna disrespect their customs, I'm just gonna walk into the middle of the city and I'm just gonna start preaching. And not only am I going to start preaching, I'm going to say their city's going to be burned to the ground in 40 days. Why? Because I've made a choice in my new life to, to forget the old guy, right? And we, we, we're all, none of us want to be defined by our mistakes, but all of us want to repeat them. We do. And it's very easy to look at somebody else and say they're making the same mistakes their parents did. And guess what? They're at home saying the same thing about you, Right? 
And when we, when we get a second chance, when God has given us a second opportunity, do not squander it by making the wrong choice. Do not squander it by saying, this Jesus guy is awesome and I love my church family, but I'm gonna make the same destructive decisions now that I'm on the other side. Because guess what's gonna happen? Jonah one and two repeat. It's, right, we talked about it last week. Some people, when we are consumed with the consequences of our choices, we don't always get spit up by the sea monster. You're not always that lucky. But for whatever reason, we think because we have Jesus now that we can just do whatever. And Jonah's message was very different to a city that needed to repent and receive God's mercy. And I'm not, what I'm not saying is that if you continue making bad choices that you're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we expect to make bad choices and we're like, oh, Jesus paid it all, we're good. And he says, well, yeah, but you're really gonna have bad consequences for that in this life because that's just the way that it works. You know, the law of sowing and reaping still exists whether you're a believer or not. Like, we cannot expect to experience God's blessing by living the opposite way. We just can't. And so that, that is Jonah's message. And so this takes an interesting turn here when we look at the verbiage. And I'm going to get a little nerdy on you guys here, but I promise that there's a payoff to it. Um, but Jonah's phrasing here, he says, in 40 days, Nineveh will, uh, the English text says, be overturned. Uh, but in the Hebrew text, it's just one word, and it's, I'm going to say it, say it five times fast, you may make a really bad mistake, um, but the word is hafak, okay? Say that five times fast, right? And this term can mean, <laughs> go ahead, get it out. Uh, I had to practice last night, I'm like, don't mess that up. Don't mess that up in front of the camera, it's not going to be good. Um, <laughs> but this Hebrew term uh, means it's, it's layered, and so when Jonah gives this message to us, uh, when we hear it, it, it seems like, like, wow, that's a really short message. Like, there's no, there's really nothing there. But there's really, and this ties into the whole story, as we'll see. Um, but when he uses this word, uh, the form in the sentence is nepachet. And so what that means is, is to turn or change. And what he's saying is that in 40 days, Nineveh will be turned. That's very simple, and that's very loaded when you consider the implications. The implication is that they will either turn to righteousness or they will turn as in be thrown over, as in they will be destroyed. Packed into Jonah's message of, of grace and repentance to them, he says, listen, you have two options. You can turn or you can be overturned. You can, you can make the choices that you want and that's fine, but at the end of the day, like, you know, if you don't choose and change your course here, like, you will be overturned. And so the city will turn or it will, either it will either turn itself around or it will be overturned. It's your choice. Divine truth demands a response. And the principle of the same, we, or I'm sorry, the principle we <clears throat> is the same. We will turn or we will be overturned. This thing of repentance, right? I'm not just saying that because I want you guys to be robots and do everything, you know, a certain way. Like this is a, this is a biblical thing. This is a biblical truth that, that needs to be communicated. The Bible's very clear. Like, we can turn from, you know, the us that we used to be, the us that we're so glad that, that God forgot about and forgave, right? But we, we have to turn from that. Why? Because we will be overturned if we do not turn. That's a loaded statement from Jonah. Such a small, compact message, but, but the Hebrew text is very there's, a whole, there's layers of meaning to it that we just miss because of, because of translation. And so it can be a positive or a negative turn, but it's ultimately your choice. It's ultimately none of his choice what kind of outcome this situation sees. And I think a lot of times we feel very helpless as far as, you know, what, what is the direction of my life? I don't know what to do. I don't know what God's calling is for me. Or I don't know how to get out of this mess. Like, turn. Like, you, we know what we should and should not do, and Jonah's message is like, hey, cut it out. Like, you know what you should and shouldn't be doing. And if you choose to make the same mistakes, like, God will judge. And that's harsh, right? We don't like to hear that very much. You know, that, but that was Jonah's message, turn or be overturned. And it kind of has a, there's a similar tie here to the New Testament. There's a parallel between that and what Paul said. Uh, he says, but get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you. This is Jesus talking to Paul to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan 
to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So you're like, well, that's just Old Testament stuff, Jonah's message of repentance. No, no, that's, that's clearly not what Jesus just said. You know, Jesus is very clear that his message of grace and love and truth has a desired outcome. And the desired outcome is that we would turn from living for the kingdom of darkness to living for the kingdom of his beloved son. Like, that's it. Like, that is the desired outcome. And we, do we need to do good things for God to love us? No. But this is a reciprocal response. Jesus said, I, or I'm sorry, First John says, we loved him because he first loved us. His, regardless of what we do, his love is before anything that we could have ever done. So there, there's, not a, there's no implications as far as like doing good things to earn God's favor, but Jesus said, listen, I want my message to reach everybody, and part of what makes that happen is that you stop looking like you're a member of the opposing kingdom, is that you stop acting like the people that are opposing me, right? But we, we just, and I think part of it's cultural, right? We're Americans, we're free, we do whatever we want, right? Part of it's cultural, but what Jonah is saying what Jesus is saying, the message here is, is we need to turn. We need to stop playing around, and we need to start living for God's kingdom. And Jonah's message that he preached to his enemies several thousand years ago is the same message that we need to be preaching to ourselves today. We need to wake up every day and say, how can I turn from what God does not want me to do? How can I be, how can I more, live more in my identity in Christ so, the desire of Jesus' gospel is the same as Jonah's. Second takes are not given so that we can continue the behavior from the first. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew twelve forty one: the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus said, listen, they repented to this guy that they met for like five minutes who got thrown up from a whale, okay, like, they believed him. And here I am, the son of man, the son of God, standing before you like they're going to judge you. Why? Because I'm giving you a very clear message from God himself, and, they, and they're going to look at you and say, you're stupid. Like, we did the right thing. We repented, right? Like, that's, you know, Jesus is like, listen, like, they're, this gen, and this was a, a specific group of people he was talking to, but we, but we do that. Like in, in the 21st century, we have more access to truth, more access to scripture than any other generation prior. And, and Jesus would say like, there, there are those that have gone before you that are gonna stand in judgment against you because they did more with what they had and you have far more. To whom much is given, much will be required. Are we doing okay? <laughs> this is hard. This was hard for me this week. So Jonah's message hits home. We're just gonna go ahead and push forward. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, and that was a big deal, laying aside his purple robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. And he issued a proclamation and said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. They're going to fast. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly that they each may turn, this is a key theme here, turning, turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked way, God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So that's the, you know, a lot of people will stop at this end of the story. Jonah preaches, everybody repents, it's all good. You know, the, the response was, was overwhelming. Uh, Jonah's message centers on imminent doom. Forty is a number employed, employed in scripture in relation to testing. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days. This is a common, a common number. Um, but some commentators have speculated that maybe, because you kind of think about it and you're like, wow, that's like a really overwhelming response. Uh, some commentators have suggested that an earthquake, an eclipse, or a plague may have prepared the people psychologically to believe. It should be noted that at this time, Assyria was engaged in a life and death struggle with various mountain tribes. 
these people had been able to push their frontier within less than 100 miles of the, the city of Nineveh. Can, so can you imagine, like, look at God's perfect timing in this, like sidebar item, like all of these circumstances working around Nineveh, and then perfectly timed for Jonah to slip in and say, hey, 40 days, and they all lose their minds, right? <laughs> Literally lose their minds. They're like, none of your pets are eating anything. Like, we're serious about this, you know? And so, but we don't, we don't really know what the circumstances were. All we know was that God positioned this to work out exactly how he wanted it to. So let's move on. The message, or I'm sorry, the response to God's message was sweeping. All the animals, all the people from the king down, and everybody, everybody got it. it was, the response was genuine, except for one person, and we'll read in chapter four. So in chapter one, so okay, so this is like total reversal again of, for Jonah. Spoiler alert, Jonah's not super happy about this. It's kind of a weird... I don't know what's wrong with this guy. I think, you know, he, he well, never mind. I'll save that comment for later. But, but there's like a reversal here. Jonah flip-flops again. And so uh, verse one of chapter four says this, but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew, <laughs> that's a really hard one to say, for I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? I can just imagine like the look on Jonah's face when God's like, you really feel like you can be angry right now? And he's like, yes, yes, I feel like I can be angry right now because I knew this was gonna happen. You know, Jonah is like visibly upset to his core. And as we talked about in chapter one, like Jonah wishes for his own death, I think like four times in this chapter. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, he's, very, he's very unhappy. And so in chapter one, you'll kind of notice that, that Jonah forces himself into exile from his own country. He would rather leave and go out into the open sea to God knows where than be in the same country where the presence of his God is. So there's like this theme of exile and going into chapter four, we read this in verse five. Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So in chapter, in chapter one, Jonah exiles himself from the presence of God. And in chapter four, even after, watch this, after he's received a, a very divine second chance, he does it again. And you're like, where are you getting that from? I don't see that. Here's, so here's, so in the Old Testament, in Old Testament theology, the east is always associated with exile. Here's a couple examples. Adam's exile. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east of the garden gate. So there, Adam is exiled to the east of the garden. Cain's exile, and this is Genesis 4.15. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain... Vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. And then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, same word that's used in Jonah chapter one and four, and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Exile of Abraham's other children that were not Isaac. Remember, Isaac was the promised, he was the promised seed. Isaac would be Jake, uh, have Jacob and Jacob's sons and then Jesus would come from that line. So Abraham's other children were sent away. Uh, Genesis uh, 25, 6. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his own son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. <laughs> so this, like, this east thing, is a, it's a thing. Every time, and then, right? And you're like, okay, exile. The Israelites went into exile. Where did they go into exile? East to Babylon. Like this is a very present, well-known theme in the Old Testament that east equals exile. And so this is not just a, you know, whoever's writing this, they're not saying that like, yep, if you look at your compass, Jonah went east over here and that means he's at this place. Like, there's a little bit more in play. You're like, yeah, it's partially that, but, but the reason that, like, they could have just said like, he went away from the city. They said, no, he went east of the city. And so as we kind of parse this out, like Jonah, Jonah's exiling himself, he's removing himself once again from what God wanted to the east. I think this is probably east. I, don't, I can't see the sun. I don't know. Um, but to me, that's, that's my right. That's east. Um, so Jonah's back to square one. Huh? 
I don't know, maybe. It's the cosmic east, all directions. Um, <laughs> I'm in a constant state of not knowing where I'm at, so it's whatever direction I want is east. Um, so, but there's this theme of exile. When Jonah is exiled, or when, when he goes east, it's a symbol that, like, hey, like this, all this exile stuff that we've talked about in Old Testament, like, you know, the writer's like, hey, that's, that's what's going on right here. And so, that Jonah's back to square one. Whether he would like to think so or not, he's following a pattern of self-exile once again, running from what he knows God wants. And I think a lot of us, right, we can either point at ourselves, which I think is most productive, or we can point at other people and say, like, they just, they just have a pattern of doing these things. They may not see it, but they always just seem to walk right back into whatever, you know. The, the problems that they've been trying to escape from, they just willfully walk right back in. And we do the same things. Why? Because we're sheep. The Bible calls us sheep. Spoiler alert, all of you in the crowd who are calling other people sheep for whatever political reason, we're all sheep, right? That's what the Bible says. <laughs> the Bible says, you know, we're, we're in here fighting about who's a sheep and who's not, right? Who gets the vaccine and who doesn't? And God says, all you dummies are sheep. Like, let, let that give you some perspective. And so Jonah leaves full of arrogance and self-interest and he makes a booth. In Hebrew, it's a sukkah, uh, which is a, you know, it's associated with the festival of booths in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, for himself, he makes it out of loose branches. Oddly enough, this is so awesome. This, I'm like so excited about this next part. I found this this week and I was like, dude, this is so cool. So cool. So hang with me. Um, so he builds this booth for himself. You know, he, he exiles himself to the east of the city and he builds a little shelter out of sticks. Um, that's, what the, that, that's what a Sukkot would be. Um, and so verse six, the, the Lord God appointed, so God is appointing a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant, right? So jo- <laughs> the, the whole mental picture is funny to me. Jonah, you know, he's all, he's all fume and mad and he goes over and he builds himself a little stick hut and then this plant grows and he's like, yeah, it's my plant. It's good stuff. Like it, it grew up and I've got shade now and I would imagine it was like super hot in Assyria. That's just my guess. I don't really know. Jason, is it hot in the Middle East? You've never been? Okay, my mistake. If you, I, I'm just, assu- I'm, I look at me up here making assumptions. I'm like, you look like you're from there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> anyway, to a, <laughs> never mind. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> to appropriate is to appreciate. Uh, moving on. So he has this plant, right? Man, I got to get that laugh out of my system. Um, so he has this plant, and he's sitting there, and I, I was reading this, and I was like, gosh, like, it's so, like, it's such a weird word that is used for this plant. Um, there's there's a, a couple of words that you could use in the Hebrew text for a plant or a tree or a bush that are all, like, very common, very easy to parse out, but this one is different. And so when I was reading, I'm, I'm looking, and I'm looking at morphologies, and I'm looking at all these different things to try to give some, give some reason to, uh, to why, why this is what it is. And this is the only passage in the Hebrew Bible that uses this specific phrase for any kind of plant. And there's, there's been like debates like, well, what kind of plant is it? And you know, we fight over what kind of plant it is. You know. um, most scholars think it's a castor oil plant. It's not super significant. Um, but that being said, the Hebrew word here is uh, kikayon, uh, which just is a, is a plant with like tendrils and leaves is, is kind of what they think. Um, and I'm like, okay, that just doesn't, that still doesn't, like why would the writer use that? Like, why is that significant? And so, and as, as I'm looking through, <laughs> so there's a Hebrew word for shame that is spelled almost identical and sounds almost identical. And that word is, is kikalon. And so God is, you know, the writer is subtly putting this in here. There's like a word play going on where, you know, you've got this random word for plant. And if you're a Hebrew, you know, listener or reader, you're like, huh, that's weird. That sounds a lot like shame. And you would be correct. And so what happens is, you know, Jonah, you know, he, he makes a fool of himself. He goes to the east, and he's sitting there, and God's like, yeah, let me just plant you a little shame tree real quick. Let me, <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a plant. God appointed the plant to grow. He's like, I'll give you something, Jonah. I'll give you a kikayon. You know what I mean? It sounds a lot like shame. And Jonah's just enjoying it. He's like, yeah, I love this plant. This is my favorite plant right now. I'm not going to speculate as to what kind of plant it was, but he was pretty happy about it. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> the similarity and, and Jonah's present behavior would explain the writer's choice of words. It makes perfect sense. 
And so the, the message being communicated here is that Jonah's literally sitting in his own shame. You know, he, he has threw his second chance away, and he is sitting presently in his own shame with this little, like, stick hut that he has made, and he thinks he's, like, the best, right? Like, he thinks he has the moral high ground. He's arguing with God about what's right, and God says, shame, shame plant right there. It's gonna, just gonna, you can just sit on that. And then God lets a worm eat it, <laughs> which is even funnier. He's like, hope you enjoyed that for like a, a day, so I'm gonna make a worm eat it now. So, but, but here, here's the thing. Shame looks like shelter to those who are only concerned about themselves. To Jonah, this thing was the best thing since sliced bread. And guess what? Sliced bread wasn't even around yet, right? Like this was the best thing ever. And God says, no, that's actually shame. You should actually be ashamed of your actions because of how you've been, you've been treating these people and you've been treating me, but you're actually really happy about it. Like this, this plant is a symbol of just how shameful and disgraceful you really are as a person. And for those of us who are sitting here today and you're, you know, it's like a, like a litmus test. Like, well, how do I know if I'm like, you know, like how do I know where I'm at with this? And so like I said, shame looks like a shelter. Sometimes sitting in your shame and doing what is shameful is more comfortable than doing the right thing. That's why Jonah was doing what he was doing. Why? Because he was only concerned about himself. How are we doing? Are we concerned about other people? Or is it just me, myself, and I? Those are the only three people you care about, right? No. Shame looks like shelter. So what looked like a blessing to Jonah was really just a portrait of who he really was. Hebrews says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, and I'll end with this. This is the end. I'm way over on time. I told Miss Sherry I'd be done at 12.15. That was 10 minutes ago. Um, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 12.2 says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, Jonah delighted in shame. Jesus despised it. Like, look at the parallel here. And look at, you know, Jesus said he was like Jonah, but greater. Jonah sat in his shame and dwelled in it and liked it. And Jesus said, I hated every second of it. I hated every second of the shame that, that the cross did to me, but I endured it because of the joy that was set before me. What was the joy set before him? It was you. You were the joy set before him, so he was able to endure and despise that shame. Second takes are never just about you. You, you didn't get a second chance because it's all about you. You got a second chance because it's all about everybody else. You got a second chance because of how God wants to use you to help other people. That's the thing. That's why we get second takes. Okay, so three practical takeaways for your second take. I'm winding down. Number one, don't define yourself or others, right, based on past wins and losses, you are not, just like you cannot hang your mistakes over yourself anymore, you also cannot hang your wins over yourself, right? The mistakes that are in the past, the wins are there with them. You're no better than anybody else. You will not experience future victory if you were obsessed with past loss. That's it. I come from a, a sales background, and they were always, it was always, don't rest on your laurels, you'll get soft. Don't think about the deals you closed last month, think about what you need to do this month, because if you're thinking about the past, you're not going to close anything. And the same is true in our life. If we're thinking about, well, I did good last month. I was really, I was really generous last month, so I'm okay this month, right? And that's, that's how we think. We think that I'd overdo it, and then I'd take a break on being a Christian. That's how we talk about it. That's, or, uh, that's how we think about it, right? Number two, choose to turn from what made you, or sorry, choose to turn from what made your first take so bad. Here's, like, here's the thing. You got a second take for a reason, don't run back to what made you need a second take. Turn or be overturned. We can't, we can't expect our second take to go well doing what, what made us need one. Number three, don't throw away your second take. We've, we've all, right, looking at this from a divine perspective, looking at it from the director's cut, right? We've all been given a second chance, and this is not something that everybody gets, right? But Jonah threw it away. Jonah went into self-exile once again. Don't be like Jonah. 
Don't, don't throw the second chance that God gave you away because you just can't get away from what you used to do. Don't, don't run back to the old you because guess what? Somebody else might not have the chance that you have and you're just throwing it away. You're just, you're just throwing this opportunity away and guess what? That hurts other people, right? Because second takes are for, are for other people around you. And if you're throwing it away, you're throwing them away. Thank you for watching and joining us for our church online. I pray this experience was just what you needed today. If you made a decision for the Lord to follow Christ, or if the Lord did something in your heart that was special today, we would love to hear about it. Post it in the comments, send us a message, and we'll reach out to you. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.